I suppose. Um, so let's start now. And um, we have uh, Mathara uh, Umachatra uh, as our next speaker. And she's from the University of Oxford. And the title of his talk is Classics at the, the Borderlands, How to Decolonize a Discipline. Let's welcome her. Um, thank you for having me today. Thank you to um, Matt for existing and to Maria for the invitation to speak. Um, part of what I think projects of decolonization involve is critical reflection on modes of scholarly production. And I'm excited to have to do some of that with you um, in the next 20 minutes or so and in the conversations that we're going to have um, in the next couple of days. Um, so in writing and thinking about how to decolonize as a scholarly praxis, I've turned to the Chicana thinker and activist Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, she might be familiar to some of you, she might not be, that's okay. I will do my best to um, introduce her. Um, the motivation to turn to Anzaldúa came from Slera Ahmed's citation pra praxis in her manifesto, Living a Feminist Life, from 2017. Trained at the Cardiff Centre for Critical and Cultural Theory, Sarah Ahmed could have inscribed herself within an orthodox tradition of philosophy derived from, for example, Lacan or Derrida. Instead, what she does at the start of this manifesto uh, is to make clear that she's not interested in um, inscribing herself into a genealogy of white male philosophy. Um, so that's not any particular individual, but um, an institution of white male philosophy. Instead, she makes the intentional choice in her citations. She cites only those who have contributed to intellectual genealogy, intellectual genealogy of feminism and anti-racism, including work that has too quickly been cast aside or left behind, work that lays out other paths created by not following the official paths laid out by disciplines. So to choose different theoretical tools, as Ahmed urges us to do, is one of the first actions that we can take to chip away at institutions of work patriarchy and resituate our relationships to them. So I turn to Gloria Anzaldúa in this spirit as a formidable thinker and practitioner of decolonization, someone to whom we can look for help when we want to forge paths through disciplines and new ways through the epistemic frameworks of disciplines that have been material har materially harmful, both to those within and those outside of the academy. So um, more on Ansel Dua in a moment. Um, let me describe to you my scholarly position and how um, I've come to classics um, with a decolonizing frame of mind. So I was trained as an undergraduate um, in Oxford um, and in classics, and I did a master's at University College London, and then I did my PhD at Princeton. So squarely within classics as a disciplinary training. Um, I sought out these very august institutions deliberately as a way of, um, as credentials as a way of accruing to myself some of the cultural capital um, that they have. And I don't know if that's a strategy that's paid off, but I'm a keynote speaker today, so maybe it has. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but as I've cut a, a path through these institutions and through the discipline of classics, it's become clear to me that I'm not beholden to or even bound by the traditional founda foundations and formations of what it means to be a classicist. So, in fact, a sort of critical consciousness of what classics is, how it's been formed as a discipline, and what Greco Roman antiquity can stand for as a cipher are the things that motivate my work now. I'm not interested really in um, only doing critiques of classics, I'm interested in the potential resources that lie in reading ancient texts. I'm frequently not comfortable in my home discipline and the normative ways in which antiquity as an object of study has been constituted. Yet, and this is a big yet, 
I'm kind of fascinated by discomfort, by scholarly discomfort, by intellectual discomfort. Um, I'm curious about that as a feeling um, that I feel in my body and why it's structurally produced. Um, in my research, in my day job, um, I attend to other inside outsiders who, because of their personal situations, um, make a critical virtue of not quite belonging. Um, so for my dissertation, I studied two German Jewish thinkers who escaped um, from National Socialist Germany and made their homes um, outside of Europe. So I um, looked at a philosopher, Theodore Adorno, and a literary critic, Eric Albach. Um, and these guys are, if you go and talk to anyone in comparative literature or in critical theory, these guys are not outsiders. They are very much foundational or iconic figures. But what was interesting to me was to uh, revisit these foundational figures and to um, ask what gave them a critical edge, what made them feel like outsiders, and how that those feelings of discomfort translated into a critical framework or a new way of doing philosophy or literary criticism. So at root here is looking critically at what heritage, tradition, um, inheritance, um, debt, all of these words, all of these ways that we traditionally, <laughs> all of these ways in which we describe relationships to um, the ancient past. Um, so I'd say that my larger project is to think about how to revisit relationships with Greece and Rome with a critical lens, <laughs> as, to, as well as to unpick what classicism is as a cultural gesture. Um, but also in forging new paths, drawing on alternative epistemic and cultural tools and the ones I trained with is vitally important to me. I remain part of classics as a discipline, not because I'm scared to leave home, though leaving home is scary, or not because there, I don't think there might be other intellectual homes for me within the academy. I'm not invested in the timelessness of Greece and Rome or its eternal glory or upholding uh, notions of um, intrinsic value of classical antiquity. But I want to stick with the discomfort of classics because I believe there are radical possibilities of looking at contemporary problems in the world um, and shedding strange new lights on these problems by turning back to antiquity. Um, if that sounds like quite a complex hearing and varying of shifting always backwards and forwards between time, I think that's the kind of critical work that needs to happen if you're a classicist. Um, and it's not a particularly strong account. It's not a particularly confident one of what it means uh, to engage with the classics. Um, but I'm prepared to do that work. Um, and I think it's important um, because the classics have so often been involved in really powerful political projects um, that cause harm, that do violence, epistemic violence, um, as well as material and real violence that's involved in colonialism and imperialism. Um, I think my big problem with the classics, um, and the one that I will get to Ansel Dua in a moment, um, but the, the problem that Ansel Dua helps me think with um, is that it's really hard to unpick classical antiquity, the Greeks and the Romans, from uh, triumphalist narratives about Western civilization. Um, and kind of with that, from white patriarchy. And these two things have clustered together um, in fascinating ways. And the fascination there is what I think scholarship can unpick. But um, I don't think scholarship is sufficient in and of itself. Um, the tools that have traditionally been used to investigate classics are not sufficient for themselves. Um, the usefulness of ancient texts, then, uh, for me, is always going to be a comparative exercise. I'm interested in the ways that classics might be divested from domination and put to work as parts of 
projects of liberation, collective feminist anti-racist liberation. The first step then is divestment, to divest classics from grand narratives domination and Western civilization might be the grandest narrative. Um, and what that means is to look at the Greeks and Romans without seeing them as this paradigmatic or foundational moment of Western civilization. Once we've done that divesting work, then we can put antiquity into conversation with other thinkers and other contexts. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what the payoff is. I just hope that it is not reinscribing domination. Again, another weak account. Okay, so let me turn to Gloria and Zaldua finally, in the name of trying to work out whether we can pull this off, whether we can divest the Greeks and Romans um, from the epistemic frameworks of cultural power. Okay. So this is Gloria and Zaldua. Um, she's a major figure in some parts of the academy, but not particularly well known to um, philosophers trained in the analytical or uh, Eurocentric continental tradition. And I don't think particularly well known to classicists either. Um, in short, anyone whose training has primarily been within um, Eurocentric institutions. Um, there is an international society dedicated to her thought, and they um, uh, had a colloquium at the Sorbonne um, last month. Um, and so there are ways in which her thought is uh, still generative some 25 years after um, her main intervention, which is this book, Borderlands, La Frontera, um, and some 15 years after her death. So Apaldua was born in the United States in the Rio Grande Valley at the border of Texas and Mexico um, into a family that had been in America for six generations. Um, she died in Santa Cruz in California and her body was taken back to the Rio Grande Valley. As Aldua contributed foundational works to um, Chicano, Chicanics, um, cultural theory, feminist theory, and queer theory. She uh, is very much of that um, wave of feminism that was proud to call itself lesbian. Um, her overall body of work is testament to a creative and multi-talented intellect. She collaborated on writing children's books, she painted, she wrote poetry. Um, um, so, yes, this is the book for which she's best known, um, La Frontera, the new Mestiza is the subtitle. Um, it's a book that defies generic categorization. The International Society of the Study of uh, Gloria Anzaldúa observes some of the boundary crossings um, that this book does. Um, so it's somewhere between autobiography, um, autohistoria, autohistoria teoria, so auto history theory, political essays, literary musings, and poetry. It's really hard to know what if, if we were librarians or if we were um, in Waterstones where to actually put this book, because there's an, more, as much poetry in here as there is um, critical essays or something that we might tangibly put our hands on as philosophy. Um, so it's formally a borderland text, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the subtitle, The New Mestiza, clues us into the core argument that Ansel Dua is trying to make about how to exist in the borderlands. Um, so, this is a map of the Texas-Mexican um, border, and um, you can see the Rio Grande River, the natural border, um, and we can recognize um, that this has long been a site of political um, and cultural contestation, as well as mixing. Um, and. Uh, present political events uh, only serve to confirm that, I think. So, I say that as an aside, and it really shouldn't be an aside, 
um, what Ansel Dua is able to provide us is to, uh, in part is a historical perspective that this is not a problem pertinent or created only in 2016 to 2018. Um, this has been a, a site of contestation, a problematic site, a generative site. This borderlands um, was her home and she finds discomfort in it. Um, but she's writing in 1987. So it, it, we're starting to get a historical perspective of what the borderlands could be and what uh, historical consciousness of being in the borderlands could look like. Okay, so um, the subtitle is the new Miss Tisa, and she's giving us an idea about what the consciousness, what it feels like to be in the borderlands. <laughs> um, so I really love these covers. Um, the fourth edition, the 25th anniversary edition is slightly boring, I think. Um, and um, the image on the front cover that you see repeated is, um, she works a lot with serpent imagery um, drawn from mythology that from that's indigenous to the borderlands through um, Nautal mythology. And um, so this is a kind of critical image for her, which is why it's repeated. I think it's a kind of shame that you only see it sort of in its ghostly, you see that, that that's in its sort of like ghostly reproduction there. Um, okay, so what is this consciousness that she's talking about? And how is it produced? At the confluence of two or more genetic streams with chromosomes <clears throat> constantly crossing over, this mixture of races, rather than resulting in an inferior being, provides a hybrid progeny, a mutable, more malleable species with a rich gene pool. From this racial, ideological, cultural, and biological cross-pollinization, an alien consciousness is presently in the making, a new mestiza consciousness, una conciencia de mujer. It is the consciousness of the borderlands. The promise that Anzaldo is holding out in this is a radical theory of inclusivity and diversity. I sort of stop using the word diversity, but because it gets, because it's been so commodified. But here in this moment of theorization, you can see that it's a virtue to have mixing. So when I called, when I was about to call the borderlands a problem, it certainly is a difficult space for Ansel Dua, but it's not exactly a problem precisely because this mixing, this diversity um, that is not only racial, that is not only biological, right, but turns into an ideological stance that turns into a way of looking um, is a strength and not a problem. And those two things have to coexist, both um, the difficulty of being there and the um, intellectual resources that we can gain by sticking with that discomfort. Um, so I want to take a look at Ansel Dewey's use of language at, um, as a site of this cross-pollinization um, and language as the structure um, within which this radical inclusivity is conceived. Um, so you can see here she's slipping between English and Spanish. Um, and uh, I'm going to have a look at how English and Spanish, um, as well as other types of language, are used in the rest of this book. So in the process of writing, and writing herself as a lesbian Chicana feminist, um, it's very clear in this book that writing is a super painful process for Ansel Dua, one of self-realization, one of discovery, um, and one that she documents with meticulous and unflinching honesty. Um, so she constantly returns back to her um, upbringing in the Rio Grande Valley, um, its uncompromising climate, its native soil. You can't grow much in the valley. Um, but she is inspired and she takes her coordinates like the um, image I showed you on the front cover. Um, she's really inspired by how intellectually fertile this space is. 
And part of what's um, fertile for her is it's multiple colonizations, right? So it's not just, oh, it was the Spanish. And that's why the, he like the hegemonic uh, language or cultural discourse here is Spanish. She was also attentive to, on top of the Spanish layer, is the English layer. So what happens um, at the, in the Rio Grande Valley um, during the period of British colonization. Um, and Antaldo is trying to weave herself in and out of those multiple uh, formations and reformations of power. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. Um, let me back up for a second. I'm double sided. I'm just trying to work out where I am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, um, hy hybridity is not a new concept for post-colonial theory, right? Um, it's one that um, is right there with, for example, Omike Baba. Um, and so part of what I'm interested in is how decolonization is different from the sort of standard toolbox that we have um, from post-colonial theory, which after all, is a um, has its canons, has its canonical writers, has its tools that it likes to turn to. Um, but what I think that Borderlands offers us um, as a theory of decolonization, as opposed to post-coloniality, is this idea of discomfort um, that I've um, been, that I've raised, and I think it's one of the most useful things that I've gotten out of thinking with um, Antaldua. Um, I think it's also relevant that um, the book was banned in 2011 um, as part of a concerted legislative attempt to stymie Mexican-American studies um, in certain parts of Texas, right? This is, it's dangerous to kind of um, conceive of the sort of mixing that Ansel Dewan notes as the baked into the culture of Texas as a huge state, right? But also in its borderland territories. Um, so Anzal Dua's manifesto gives us a way of understanding hybridity as a tool of reframing our relationships to power structures. The mestiza, the mixed part of this, is not an insistence that we have to move past um, or beyond, which is kind of my sticking point with post-colonial, like what comes after that? But instead, instead, it asks us to sit with the discomfort of reckoning with structures of power, even as we ourselves might inhabit them. So Borderlands is a tour de force performance of decolonization. And this, sorry, this is where I'm gonna start talking about her language, okay. Um, so we've seen that she moves readily between English and Spanish, and that's quite a deliberate move. Um, but she also, as the book goes on, um, as the manifesto goes on, uh, starts to introduce other kinds of language. And that shift is interesting for us as we try and uh, decolonize or renegotiate our relationship with structures of power. Um, and Part of the reason that I um, am honing in on language specifically is that as a classicist, classics is sort of a discipline that is cohered not by much, but at minimum by a mastery over Greek and Latin. Have you really read your Homer unless you've read him in Greek? And I guess the question in philosophy is, have you really read your Kant if you haven't read him in German? 
Um, so the issue of translation is a really important one. Um, and uh, there's a kind of idea that the language, reading in original ancient language or original language um, is the key in which you get mastery over a set of knowledge, which is why Ansel Dewar's uh, mixing between English and Spanish, and as I'm going to talk about in a second, um, finding that English and Spanish themselves are mixed and are constantly shifting um, is a really important tool of um, looking at mastery and linguistic mastery as a mode of um, creating um, dynamics of power over knowledge um, and, and refiguring what it would be to hold those tools. Um, so I learned Spanish at high school um, and have not used it in my intellectual work since. It's not one of the um, standard um, scholarly languages in my sub-discipline of classics. Um, and I only recently learned about Nautal, it's, even its mere existence, um, because I was teaching a play by um, a Chicana playwright called Luis Alfaro, who wrote a version of the Medea called Mojada. Um, so I'm not claiming expertise here. I come with some intellectual humility to this. Um, but the shift in language is one I'm going to try and track for you very briefly in the five minutes that I have left. Um, so Ansel <coughs> Dewar, by the end of Borderlands, has made the case that Chicano Spanish is really important to look at. Um, she calls it an infant language, a bastard language, one that's not approved of by any society. So she's raising the idea that there is a hierarchical um, order of knowledge that goes hand in hand with hierarchical um, orders of expression. Which languages contain the resources for conceptual investigation? If English, German, French, and Iberian Spanish are the languages of philosophy, and the languages in which the colonization of the global south was historically conducted, Ansel Dewar's use of Chicano Spanish is an act of defiant, yes, de de sorry, defiance, yes, but also opens out alternatives to the forms of thought we might engage in. So this is um, from the manifesto from uh, La Frontera um, in chapter five, How to Tame a Wild Tongue. Uh, I just wanted to show you this as a way of showing how attentive Ansel Dua is to the different class structures. Um, so between uh, one and two, between um, making the difference between standard Spanish, and I, I think she's talking about Iberian Spanish versus Mexican Spanish, um, and then between four and five, differentiating between, between standard Mexican and North Mexican. So we're at the level of dialect here and uh, pointing out regional variations between five and six. Um, I have to tell you that I don't know what Tex-Mex is. I think it's something like Spanglish, um, where you slip in and out maybe within words or within the structure of one sentence. Um, and uh, Pachucho uh, is a um, native dialect um, that I think has relation to Nautal, which is the main indigenous language that she uses in the book. The wild tongue then refuses its taming in a dominant culture. And in part, I mean, I looked at this list and I didn't know uh, at first what to do with it other than to say that there are so many uh, linguistic alternatives that hold out conceptual possibilities to um, structural formations of dualistic thought, right? It's not just there's English and here are the alternatives. It's that these are uncompromisingly mixed always. Um, so um, just to finish off then, there's so much um, in this 
conceptual program that I think is useful for, for anyone who is thinking with um, ancient texts. Um, and I guess the sort of headline here is that it's that um, absolute commitment to multiplicity and to betweenness that is useful for those who want to decolonize philosophy or classics. Um, because the, I think the underlying impetus there is that it's not possible to get outside of these structures. We have to sit within them. There can be no clean extirpation of Spanish or English as the languages to which colonial legis legislation and the takeover of land was enacted. And by the time you're a sixth generation immigrant, um, there is no refusing the mixing either. Um, I quoted earlier from um, chapter seven, Towards a New Consciousness, which is the sort of really uh, the programmatic part of this text. Um, and I thought that this might be useful for us to think about some of the terms that I put on the table earlier um, about what we do with antiquity. Is it an inheritance? Is it a tradition? And so she says, pero es difícil differentiating between lo heredado, lo adquirido, lo impuesto. She, the mestiza, puts history through a sieve, winning, winnowing out the lies. Um, forgive me, I think I'm at the point where I'm about to lose my voice and also my Spanish really isn't that good. So the Spanish is there. Um, she reinterprets history and using new symbols, she shapes new myths. She adopts new perspectives towards the dark-skinned women and queer. She strengthens her tolerance and intolerance of ambiguity. She's willing to share, to make herself vulnerable to foreign ways of seeing and thinking. She surrenders all notions of safety of the familiar. Deconstruct, construct. So I'd like to offer this as a model for how we can think about what we do with classical antiquity. In the first instance, we might recognize the scholarly position that Anselduwa names, the mestiza. The inquirer is not at a distance from history, but she's already marked and wounded by the forces of history, and she's implicated in its operations. Scholarly objectivity is simply not on the table for Anselduwa because of this mestiza consciousness. Furthermore, Anselduwa draws attention uh, to the idea that it's not easy to tease apart what kind of relationship to have with a classical past that feels heavy. So she names lo heredado, lo acadido, lo impuesto, uh, inheritance, acquisition, taxation. All of those are slightly, uh, but importantly, different ways of marking your relationship to the past. And she's on a kind of truth quest in which she puts history through a sieve and she winnows so the Mestiza academic is constantly evaluating the kinds of knowledge that she's getting, even in the process of making. Um, she talks about making new myths. So this is creative responses to the past. Um, and that emphasis on creating and myth as storytelling isn't something that is relegated to the past either, right? Like this is what um, ancient peoples did, but um, modernity doesn't have its own myths. Modernity has its myth and has its own myths, and storytelling is a really important way of making meaning. And finally, um, I think that my, what might lie um, in ambiguity, which is the sort of key point, I think, of these um, those last couple of sentences, is a sort of epistemic vulnerability being comfortable with ambiguity, even as you're uncomfortable with it. Um, and I think that that's something that Matt has modeled really well, a sort of disciplinary vulnerability by um, inviting a classicist to speak to philosophers. I think it might mean methodological openness. Um, and I also think that um, ambiguity and vulnerability is an invitation to seek out reparative modes of analysis and practices. <laughs> Um, so with these coordinates, Anseldua might encourage us to decolonize by situating philosophy not at the center, but at the borderlands, approaching the past with a mestiza consciousness. Thank you. <laughs>